Chapter 2 Dylan didn't know why he did it. Perhaps it was because he had seen Kelly Snapchatting his cousin Michael. After she had left, walking down the long lane leading away from Livingston Academy, he had called Anne Michael's wife. With a few easy questions, he had confirmed Kelly had been Michael's nurse and did indeed work at Mercy Hospital. Dylan had then taken it upon himself to talk to the school's principal to ensure that registering Bentley Islington would go smoothly tomorrow when she returned. He had also gotten promises that the principal would investigate why it had been so difficult for Kelly to do a simple routine registration. Dylan didn't like to think that anyone at their school would give the new students from First Elementary or their parents a hard time. Now that he was home with the boys this evening, he had been going over the paperwork from the insurance of Mercy Hospital. It was due for another annual report, and Dylan felt that he should have someone from the Ramsley Insurance go and look over the hospital. He knew that Rhonda Coventry was looking to further her career. Perhaps he would let her assist him on an assessment, and then let her run the next few. The thought crossed his mind as he did something he normally would never do. He googled Kelly Islington. He was sure it was just idle curiosity. That was the problem with having so much information at one's fingertips, he decided. You could just put in a name and learn all sorts of things you weren't meant to. Dylan had learned that Kelly had been married to Christopher Islington, son of Margaret and Terence Islington. The Islingtons were small-time benefactors of various local charities. Terence had a chain of furniture stores. Their son, Christopher, had died of cancer at age 25. He had been married to Kelly for maybe a year. Dylan wondered why an Islington was enrolled in First Elementary, a public school in a not very good section of the city. Surely the grandparents could have paid for a private education of the boy. He also learned that Kelly had a Facebook account. She didn't post many pictures to it, and had only thirty or so people as her friends on it. It looked like it wasn't used often. Mostly she turned down invites from her friends to go places or do things, citing she couldn't get a sitter or other excuses such as having a shift to work at the hospital. Dylan decided he'd seen enough and closed his laptop. Hayden... What is the term for someone spying on other people through Facebook again? Creeping! You're a creep! Caden shouted back from the living room where he was busy doing homework. Thanks, Dylan said wryly to his oldest son. Eleven going on adult, Caden was ever helpful and had more attitude than was sometimes necessary. What are you working on? Art? Caden's voice conveyed his disgust. I don't understand why I have to take a subject that I'm not any good at. I'd be better off spending my time working on subjects that I excel in. Says who? Dylan came over to the table to see how Caden was progressing. Avery had already finished his homework and was watching a program on television. Me? Caden frowned. I'm wasting my time. Maybe so that you can have appreciation for it, even if you aren't good at it, Dylan replied. Also, it helps for you to try to do some things that you aren't good at. How can it help? he asked. Dylan thought about it. It helps your coping skills, expands your patience, and you are learning from it. What am I learning? Caden lifted an eyebrow. You might be learning that you don't like Art Deco, so when your pal says, let's go to this Art Deco exhibit, you can say you'd rather go to the abstract gallery, Dylan said. Is it really important to know this stuff? I mean, how often do you use it? Caden rolled his eyes. Not often, Dylan admitted. Mostly to impress girls like your mom. She liked art. However, there are careers like architecture or museum curator where a knowledge of art is essential. I'm going into the insurance business with you, Caden said confidently as he colored in another area of his project. You don't have to. It's your choice what you do. Dylan wanted his sons to be able to choose their own directions, not to feel pressured like he had by his father. Dylan and his siblings, Jake and Everett, had all followed their father Robert's footsteps into the family insurance business. Dylan barely saw his brothers any more as Jake was overseeing the western half of the country, while Everett was trying to break into the European insurance market. The last time he had seen them had been for Shannon's funeral. Dylan pushed the thought aside. I know, but I like math and numbers, Caden spoke up. I want to work with you. Thanks. Dylan knew by the time Caden went to college that might change. Until then, he would enjoy the sentiment behind Caden's words. Need any help with this? Nah, I got it, Caden said. 
Dylan nodded and went to check on Avery. Sometimes he worried that he worked too much and didn't spend enough time with his sons. He sat down on the couch beside Avery. What are you watching? Avery shrugged. There's nothing good on. I buy a hundred or more channels every month. I'm sure there's something good on, Dylan said dryly. It's all kid stuff, Avery complained. Thank goodness for parental controls, Dylan thought. Avery was only seven. So you're just bored, then? Avery shrugged. Do you want to do something? Dylan asked. We could play a game while Caden finishes his homework. Okay, Avery hopped to his feet. Foosball? You're on. Dylan followed Avery to the game room. Soon enough, they were engaged in a battle over the ball, gently ribbing each other and talking tactics. Dylan was having fun, and he knew Avery was enjoying it. Then his cell phone rang. Dylan automatically answered it. He was always available to his staff. He assured Avery that he would just be a moment to retrieve a file in his office. Two hours later, Dylan closed his laptop and ended the call. He hadn't meant for things to go on so long, but there were serious questions about the viability of a new customer. The restaurant franchise had some big gaps in their application for insurance, and time was running out on whether Ramsley Insurance would take them on as a client. Things needed to be investigated further before any commitment would be made. Dylan inwardly winced as he checked his wristwatch. Going out of his office, he found that the lights were off. Both boys had already gone through their bedtime routines and were sound asleep when he found them in their rooms. Dylan watched them for a moment, knowing he would have to make it up to Avery somehow. Feeling restless, Dylan went down to the kitchen. He thought about getting something to eat or having another coffee, but he didn't want the caffeine. The house really was too big for the three of them. It felt unused and half-empty most of the time. It also contained too many ghosts. The only reason Dylan stayed was that it had adequate parking for his car collection, which, if he was honest, wasn't bringing him much pleasure any more, and because he didn't want to upset the boy's routine by moving. Dylan wandered through the main floor and wondered if he would sleep at all tonight. The guilt was eating at him again. Guilt at not finishing the game with Avery. Guilt at not being the best father since he worked too much. Guilt over his daughter Shannon's death. Guilt over his wife Wren. He looked over the manicured lawn and felt the house pressing in on him. Mom, what do you mean he's not here? Kelly asked. She'd just come into her mother's house, wiping her wet shoes on the mat, when her mother had announced that Bentley wasn't there. I brought him here this morning. You were supposed to watch him. Meredith blinked. Well, I can't watch him all the time. He just disappeared. Bentley doesn't just disappear. Kelly followed Meredith into the kitchen. Where is he? I don't know. Meredith lifted a shoulder. I don't know where anyone is. Kelly rubbed her eyes. Did Josh go with him, or Moose? Moose hasn't been around for a few days, she hiccuped. I think he's working again. Kelly ignored her mother's scathing voice. Moose working would be good. She concentrated on the hiccup instead and leaned in to sniff her mother's breath. You've been drinking again. Don't judge me, Meredith hissed. Mom, I need to find Bentley. Kelly tried to stay calm. After the day she had, it wasn't working. When and where did you see him last? I don't know, Meredith clutched at the sink. Tell me what happened today. Kelly felt like she was grasping at straws. She'd known it was a bad idea to leave Bentley with her mom, but she didn't have many choices these days. Where did you go? What did you do? Ah, uh, you brought Bentley over? Meredith scrunched up her face as she tried to think. We had a nap, then lunch. I made mac and cheese. That's nice, Mom. Kelly tried not to be impatient. Then what happened? Josh came home from school. We argued. He tried to make me feel responsible, Meredith huffed. When I was his age, I was on my own. No one was responsible for me. Nowadays, kids think you need to coddle them until they're 25. Mom, what happened after you argued with Josh? Kelly interrupted her mother's rant. Meredith blinked. I don't know. I suppose they left. Did Bentley go with Josh? Kelly asked desperately. Maybe, 
she shrugged. Do you know when Moose will be back? No, Kelly gritted her teeth. She had no idea when her stepdad would return. I don't know, Mom. Oh, Merida sniffed. Kelly ignored her and started searching the house. She looked for anything that might give her a clue as to where Bentley had gone. She finally found a note taped to the light switch in Josh's room. Kelly, gone to your place, Josh and Bentley. Thank goodness. Kelly closed her eyes and slumped in relief. At least someone was responsible in this house. The sad part was that it was the barely fifteen-year-old. Kelly took a calming breath and decided not to deal with Meredith at all at the moment. She didn't want to get sucked into her mother's drama right now when Bentley had been sick today and now only had Josh watching him. Kelly went straight through the house, locking the door behind her. It didn't take long to get to the bus stop, and a half hour later she was in her own neighborhood. She dug out her keys and was about to unlock the door to the house when her landlord opened the door. "'Mrs. Islington,' the old woman grimaced, "'you're late on the rent. I need you to get caught up. I have other people waiting on the apartment.' Kelly tried to dig up a smile for the old biddy, but just couldn't. I will get you your money as soon as I find it. The landlady gave a humph of disbelief. She pushed a letter at Kelly. What's this? Kelly asked, taking the envelope. Your eviction notice. If you don't pay in full by the end of the month, you're out. The landlady stomped off and slammed her first floor apartment door. Kelly swallowed hard. She knew her bank account had nothing in it. She lived paycheck to paycheck, despite working sixty-plus hours a week. She felt like she hardly ever saw her son. The way things were going, she'd be moving back with her mom by the end of the month. That would be the ultimate failure in Kelly's eyes. She closed the door against the cold and trudged up the steep, uneven steps to the attic apartment. Josh, her half-brother, must have heard her on the steps because he opened the door to let her in. Shh, he's finally sleeping. Thanks, Josh, Kelly whispered. She shucked her coat off and dumped her purse on the ground. Do you know what she did? Josh said in disgust. She fed him candy. He's sick, and she stuffs him full of mac and cheese and then goes to the convenience store to buy twenty bucks worth of useless candy to gorge on. No wonder he was throwing up again when I got home from school. Oh, Josh, Kelly rubbed her eyes. Classic mom trying to buy love. She went to check on Bentley, who, while flushed, didn't seem to have a fever. She would have to take his temperature later. He was sleeping peacefully right now, and she didn't want to disturb him. Kelly went into the tiny kitchen. Have you eaten yet? No. Josh took out his homework and spread it on the coffee table. Can I live here? I can sleep on the couch. He asked that at least once a month. She didn't think he would ever move in because he took it upon himself to care for Meredith when Moose was away. Kelly tossed the eviction notice on the coffee table for Josh to read. She looked at the nearly empty fridge and opted for peanut butter sandwiches. Where are you going to go? Josh looked up from the letter. I don't know. Kelly sat down and offered him a couple of the sandwiches. She kept one for herself. I lost my job today. He wrapped an arm around her in a hug. Kelly leaned on him for a moment. He was such a good younger brother. I guess you could always live with us. Kelly grimaced. It might come to that. I was joking. Josh looked at her in concern. I'm really hoping you get yourself together so I can move in with you. Kelly rolled her eyes. If I ever manage to get it together, I'll let you know. Kelly groaned as the alarm went off. It was still dark outside. She didn't understand why people chose to create schedules that required them to get up before the sun. She stumbled out of bed to the shower and got ready for the day. While she brushed her teeth, she tried to find her natural optimism back. There was no point in being gloomy. She had a month to figure something out before she had to go home and beg her mom for a place to stay. Until then, she would do her best to find a good job, something that paid more and let her not work as many hours something with a signing bonus so she'd get her finances figured out. She was probably dreaming, but hey, she had until the end of the month to figure it out. She would figure it out, she told herself firmly. There was nothing else to do. Kelly shook Bentley awake. Rise and shine. How are you feeling today? Bentley stretched and yawned. I'm fine. Is Grammy in trouble? Kelly smiled ruefully. 
Maybe a little. She knows better than feed sick little boys candy. Josh yelled at her. Bentley rolled out of bed. Only because he doesn't like to see you sick. Kelly ruffled her son's hair. He loves you. He's a good uncle. Bentley nodded. Am I going back to that school today? Yep, Kelly sighed. We'll give it another try. I hope they're nicer today. Bentley picked out clothes. Me too. Kelly made sure he was okay in the bathroom before getting cereal and juice ready in the kitchen. Josh looked up from the couch. What time is it? You've got another hour yet. We have to leave early to get to Bentley's new school, Kelly explained. Josh grunted and pulled the blanket up over his head. Kelly hurried Bentley through breakfast, and they made it to the bus stop with plenty of time. Thankfully, Bentley seemed fully recovered. An hour later, and they were making their way up the two-mile trek to Livingston Academy. Kelly wasn't looking forward to doing this every school day. Why don't they have a bus stop at the end of that enormously long lane? Tiana groused as she and her son Patrick walked along beside Kelly and Bentley. Patrick was in grade eight, and technically Tiana didn't have to walk with him, but since she had time before her shift at the nursing home and she wanted to talk to Kelly, she chose to make the trek. Probably because they don't have kids who ride the public transit, Patrick said dryly. They're too rich for that. Kelly looked at Patrick's ripped jeans and sneakers with a hole in them. She knew that the kids from First Elementary were going to have a hard time fitting in. It looked like the Academy students wore uniforms. Is there a dress code? Kelly asked. Tiana snorted. Yeah, minimum $2,000 worth of dress code. They suggested first elementary kids might want to look at purchasing uniforms to fit in. Right now, it's not mandatory, since hopefully the school will be opening once the plumbing issues get fixed. I heard it's going to take until summer of next year, Patrick said. Where did you hear that? Kelly asked. Denny? His dad's a teacher at first, Patrick explained. He said they found lead pipes, which means the entire plumbing system needs to be overhauled, not just the Johns. Great! Kelly tried to find the good part in all this. That means the two of you are going to get an exemplary education for the next seven months. Some of those students you're with are going to be future Congress members. Patrick rolled his eyes. What's a Congress member? Bentley asked. Someone who is in the government, Tiana said. Speaking of taxes, Kelly looked at Tiana. Are you guys hiring? At the nursing home? Tiana shook her head. I wish. We're so overworked, it's not funny. I think three of the aides are ready to burn out, but if you're looking for a nursing position, they're filled. I thought you were happy at Mercy Hospital. Kelly grimaced. I got let go. I need a new job ASAP. I'll ask around, but it's tight right now, Tiana sighed. I wish I had better news. I'll start with the job agencies this morning after I get Bentley registered, Kelly said. I thought you got Bentley registered yesterday, Tiana asked, surprised. Kelly rolled her eyes. I'll tell you about that later. This time, Kelly brought Bentley straight to the office. She sighed when she saw the same secretary on duty, but pasted on a determined smile. Hi, I'm here to register my son Bentley. Please take a seat, Mrs. Islington, while I get the principal. The secretary immediately got up to knock on the principal's door. Kelly was surprised when he came out and went directly over to her. Mrs. Islington. He extended a hand in greeting. I'm Principal Wright. Hello? Kelly took his hand. I must apologize for yesterday, he smiled. There seems to be a miscommunication with the PTA ladies and my staff. Mr. Ramsley was very concerned that you have a smooth experience in registering your son this morning. This must be Bentley. Kelly was a bit confused. Yes, this is Bentley. You said Mr. Ramsley talked to you? Yes. Principal Wright led them into his office. He asked specifically that I take care of your registration. He did. Kelly was surprised. That was nice of him. We at Livingston Academy are pleased to be able to help out First Elementary during their reconstruction process. It's through generous donations like Mr. Ramsley's that we can afford to do so. The principal held out some paperwork. While you fill these forms in, I'll make copies of Bentley's transcript and other documents. Kelly held out the paperwork that she had. Actually, I downloaded all the necessary forms from the email that was sent to us. It should be all here. Even better. 
He gave it a cursory glance. Where is the uniform page? I was given to understand that uniforms for first elementary students weren't mandatory, Kelly hesitated. They're very costly. Principal Wright smiled. Mr. Ramsley mentioned that it might be an issue, and has offered to purchase the basic uniform package for each first elementary student that comes to Livingston Academy. Kelly blinked. There were at least forty kids from Bentley's school going to Livingston until the pipes were fixed. That meant Dylan Ramsley had just casually dropped eighty grand without blinking. Wow. He is a very kind and generous man, Principal Wright said. We're very pleased to have his children Caden and Avery attend our school. No doubt, Kelly thought. He has very deep pockets. Principal Wright set aside her paperwork. Why don't I give you the tour and then we can get Bentley settled in his new class? That would be great. Kelly couldn't believe how easy getting Bentley registered was this morning. Dylan Ramsley had obviously said something after their talk yesterday, and it had made all the difference. She wondered, not for the first time regarding the Ramsleys, what it must be like to wield all that power and wealth. Then again, there were some things money couldn't buy. Kelly put her hand on Bentley's shoulder. They followed Principal Wright as he talked about the history of the building, the art gallery, the large cafeteria, and what types of healthy meals and snacks were served, the large gymnasium with the impressive sports programs they had, the academic programs, and the large library. Kelly was going to be very disappointed when she had to bring Bentley back to the regular public school. It wasn't that she didn't think the school system wasn't good. It was just inferior compared to what money could provide at Livingston Academy. She felt very poor, and hope Bentley didn't feel the same way. She didn't want him feeling any less than any other kid here. Finally, they stopped at the grade two class. Bentley was introduced to Mrs. Connor, his new teacher who made him feel welcome. Seating was alphabetical, but Kelly was glad to see Ryan and Charlie, two kids from First Elementary. At least Bentley would have immediate friends. Kelly reluctantly left Bentley in the class, following the principal back to the office. He obtained a school uniform brochure for her and asked her to indicate what sizes would work for Bentley. He also assured her that Bentley, with all the other students from First Elementary, were enrolled in the cafeteria program so she didn't need to worry about sending snacks or lunch with him. "'Was that Mr. Ramsley's idea?' Kelly asked. Principal Wright smiled. "'He's been very helpful in ensuring that all of the children have a seamless transition into Livingston Academy.' "'I see.' Kelly looked down at the uniform guide. It looked very expensive. "'I'll be sure to thank him.' She took her leave and walked back to the bus stop. Thankfully, since she was unemployed, she wouldn't have to pay for any after-school programs or child care which had always eaten a huge chunk out of her budget. However, Kelly needed a source of income as quickly as possible. While on the bus, she filled out the basic package sizes. Two thousand dollars bought six shirts, four pants, two pairs of shorts, two ties, a sweater, and a jacket. She could go to the local thrift store and get something similar for under a hundred, but it wouldn't have the school crest on it. Kelly shook her head at the extravagance. Thank goodness she wasn't the one paying for it. She could only hope there wouldn't be any expensive field trips. Hours later, Kelly was back at the school feeling dejected. She'd been to four employment agencies, and all of them cited an overcrowded job market, especially in nursing. They promised to keep her resume on file, but since she had been terminated from her job, it was unlikely that she would receive any contact from potential employers. There were just too many people looking for work. Kelly handed in the uniform guide order form and went to collect Bentley from his class. She was surprised to see Dylan Ramsley approach her. "'Good afternoon, Mrs. Islington,' he said. "'Good afternoon,' she replied. She took a deep breath for courage, or maybe to break the spell of that voice and those nice gray eyes behind the glasses. "'I want to apologize for yesterday. I was having a tough day, and it's no excuse for some of the things that I said.' Dylan grimaced. Actually, I think you are very right about some of the things you mentioned. The truth is, we've been patting ourselves on the back at Livingston Academy for being charitable enough to take in students from First Elementary. However, the school didn't think through the entire situation. It's one thing to offer free education to First Elementary students in their time of need, but we neglected to think about uniforms, food issues, finances for field trips the things that are going to help integrate the students so that they make friends here. 
For instance, how long of a walk is it to the bus stop from the academy? Two miles? Kelly was startled that he had bothered to remember that they were walking. She was surprised that he put so much thought into the matter at all, considering it didn't directly involve his kids. She knew the other Ramsley brothers were really considerate people, too, but they had an inborn conceit that all of those born with money seemed to have. It wasn't distasteful, it was just slight arrogance that they could solve any problem since they had the cash to do so. "'That means you're walking eight miles a day just to drop off and pick up Bentley?' he asked. "'Yes,' Kelly replied simply. "'That's unacceptable.' Dylan frowned. Kelly shrugged. There's no choice. I have to do it. I can't let him walk it on his own. Tomorrow there's going to be a shuttle service, Dylan stated firmly. Today is the last day that anyone needs to walk that distance just to get to school here. A shuttle service? Meal plans for the cafeteria? The basic package for school uniforms? He must be blowing through money, Kelly thought. It's not really necessary, Kelly said. Kids from all around the city walk to school each day. But it is necessary for those parents who have small children yet still need to get to work on time, Dylan pointed out. Obviously, he remembered their conversation from yesterday when she had been late for work. True, Kelly allowed. The bell rang and she hurried to add, I wanted to thank you for everything you're doing, the meals and the uniforms. Dylan frowned. Who told you? Principal Wright. He wasn't supposed to say anything, Dylan sighed. Well, I'm glad he did, because you're going to make things a lot easier for our kids, Kelly insisted. I know that some parents will think it's charity, but I appreciate it. Anything that will help Bentley be like the other kids and give him the chance to make friends is a win. Thank you. I really do appreciate what you've done. Dylan looked a little uncomfortable with the praise, and Kelly wondered how often he was given gratitude. They were interrupted as Bentley ran to greet Kelly, and another boy went to see Dylan. Kelly ruffled Bentley's hair. How was your first day? Great, he smiled up at her. I got invited to my new friend Avery's birthday party. Really? She was glad he had made friends so fast. That's awesome. It's this weekend, Bentley said. Can I go? Sure, Kelly smiled. She loved that Bentley was so easy to get along with and had a natural knack for making friends. Are you ready to go? Yep. He waved to the boy near Dylan. Bye, Avery. Kelly realized the boy was Dylan's son as he gave a quick wave back, then grabbed his dad's hand, chatting a mile a minute as they slowly walked down the hall. She wondered if Avery's dad had put him up to inviting Bentley and the other boys from First Elementary to his birthday party. Even if he had, at least Bentley was being included. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of reluctant husband. Also, please subscribe to the channel to enjoy other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.